Everybody, welcome back to allcounselors.com in our inclusive therapist series. And I have met a new friend today, and we're going to be talking about, uh, as reference to the inclusive inclusive therapist series, um, serving and supporting the Jewish community. And I've got Yakov Denishevsky. How'd I do? Pretty good. Thanks for having okay. me. Yes, thank you for being here. Um, now, I will probably continue to butcher your bio, but you are a uh, LCSW and a CSAT based in Chicago. You've got a practice um, called Mind Body Therapy. But bef- for me to uh, butcher your bio, would you tell us a little bit about yourself? And um, you're a LCSW CSAT, so you do a lot of work with s- sexual addiction, I believe. Mm-hmm. And um, but. Would you tell us a little about yourself and your practice? Yeah, sure. So I, as you said, uh, LCSW and CSAT. So um, I work with general kind of garden variety type uh, type issues, life adjustment type things, um, some anxiety, some depression. Uh, but the areas that I really focus on and what I would say I've done some specialty trainings in and um, and, and a lot of uh, of of reading and supervision and, and more of what my experience is in is working with trauma um, and uh, and sex addiction in particular and couples counseling. Uh, so kind of those three areas is what I really focus on. Um, a lot of the trauma um, is kind of the capital T trauma, but actually I would say more so is more attachment-based trauma, more um, lowercase t trauma, thematic type trauma. Um, and that that's a lot of, uh, a lot of what I do. Um, in, addi- in addition to the, to the sex addiction work. And obviously those two things uh, often go hand in hand. Um, when I started out working, um, I, was, I would say I was working with a more general population. Um, as the few years have gone by, um, I think just because of needs within my uh, kind of personal community within the Jewish Orthodox community, um, the way things have evolved, um, I still work with people outside of the, the Jewish community. Um, but I, I, over the years, I've uh, become more and more um, engaged specifically with that population. Um, I would say primarily uh, Jewish Orthodox uh, men um, and couples um, have become, I would say, the bulk of my of my caseload. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, so I, I started uh, my own private practice um, just a few months ago. Uh, I've worked in a, in a couple of other group practices prior to that. Um, actually, how, how we got introduced from Steve um, is one of the one of the first places I worked, um, and he's good people. Yes, he is. He's great. Steve and Lisa are amazing. They're the best. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so so I started this practice, um, and uh, yeah, it's been it's been it's been great so far. So what led you to? Um, oh, well, here's another fa- thing I saw in your bio too: is you're an ordained rabbi. I am. And that was actually my initial my initial career path. I was hoping to become a, uh, a synagogue rabbi, uh-huh. uh, and life takes its uh, its interesting turns. And uh, <laughs> at the time, I was very upset that I was uh, discovering that that wasn't going to be a great choice for my family lifestyle, and got involved in some rabbinate type things, and just started getting steered the other way. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and then I actually took a different path. I was looking to go for a PhD in uh, Jewish. Uh, Jewish mysticism, Jewish philosophy, and, uh, and then got uh, rejected from where I was planning on going. And then so I took another turn and landed on the LCSW and then accidentally landed on an internship in a, in a practice that specialized in sex addiction, not even really realizing, um, mm-hmm. not even really realizing that that's what it was. Um, I had never heard of, I had never even heard of sex addiction. I didn't know it wasn't intentional. And I just kind of fell in love with that work. And from there, mm-hmm got introduced to, to, to a lot of trauma work and EMDR and uh, somatic experience and kind of more body focused therapy. Um, none of that was planned at any stage along the way. <laughs> so I'm, 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 I'm luckily irresponsible, I guess, in some way. <laughs> I, I, I think it's a lot of you clinicians. I'm not a clinician, as you probably know, but um, talk about serendipity. And I go, this is no, this sounds serendipitous for you yeah. to be here. And ministering, serving, supporting, um, a a group of people that you understand Mm -hmm. and, um, are likely my guess is underserved too. Yeah. Yeah. Which is the, the topic for today. But, um, I, I love seeing the, 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 
crooked path is the way I look at it for mm-hmm. myself. Cause I go back and I go, I don't know how I ended up here, but I'm glad I did. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah. Well, congratulations on your um, going out on your own. And that's a fun journey too. And that's what we try to do here at all counselors is serve and support clinicians like you doing the good work in the world. So, but that's for another topic. I want to get straight into, um, we've talked about, um, we have a different uh, webinars talking about underserved, you know, underrepresented people groups in our society and culture. And I'm really curious to, to get your input uh, and feedback on the Jewish population that you serve. And there, you know, what Steve did, and by the way, Steve Lackey, he is part of our advisory board at allcounselors.com, um, has really helped us map out and go, listen, we need to start paying attention to groups that are very underserved and uh, in, in our culture. And so he's really helped us lay out and have conversations like this with you. But one thing he's told me, and I just want to ask the general question is, you know, you've done therapy with not just Jewish people, but mm-hmm. broader. And one thing he helped bring to light, particularly for um, uh, African-Americans is the drastic difference in how it's not a one size fits all thing. Mm-hmm. It, therapy mm-hmm. isn't, yeah. but I'm curious your initial thoughts on, serving and supporting as a therapist, um, the Jewish people and, yeah. and some of those nuances and differences that, that you've seen and that would help our audience that may help serve Jewish people, but not as, you know, directly as you might. Yeah, sure. Um, and, and I so appreciate that this was, uh, that this, there's a webinar on this and, and that you're reaching out to me in particular, but just more broadly speaking, I, I really appreciate the, uh, the, the value in doing this. Uh, so, I mean, I, I would say also in terms of that, that perspective that Steve shared, I mean, for me, um, I always find it really fascinating how there's, al- there's always this pervasive human condition that mm. is broader and maybe deeper than any culture, race, religion, ethnicity, or anything like that. There's just humanity. Um, and mm. across in my experience, there are there are that that fundamental dynamic of what it means to be a human being that's alive in this world, uh, to be a finite being in this world, um, and and the all the the psychological and existential uh, pieces that come along with that that go across that go across cultures, um, but then at the same time there are so many differences and nuances and unique situations and unique experiences that enter into that humanity for different people. Um, and so that kind of either paradox or balance or however you want to look at it is always, is always really interesting. And, and, you know, I love that kind of thing because it keeps you in a learning state. And so it makes it, it makes the work curious and interesting in an ongoing kind of a way. But by the way, I should have said, I'm a student. I mean, I'm asking questions, but today I'm a student because I think from this whole conversation, particularly talking with Steve and Lisa, incredible humans, but bringing things to my awareness that I go, I have my own work to do, hmm. uh, you know, yeah. and, and, and all of this. And there may be things I ask or something I gladly cur- uh, invite your correction to or guidance, uh, but I selfishly, when we put this series together, go, I want to learn. Yeah. I need to learn. Just, yeah. just knowing those two amazing people have helped me shed a, shed a different light and see from a different perspective than my own. I'm based in Oklahoma. I was gr- grew up here, uh, probably, you know, in the buckle of the Bible belt, you know, so I have a lot to learn. So all that to say, yes, yeah. I, I'm a student today. Yes. Um, well, that makes two of us. So we'll, we'll go both directions on that. <laughs> so, you know, I, and so that's just kind of a, a preface to, to share. Mm-hmm. Um, and then more specifically getting into the Jewish community. So uh, I want to kind of give two, two pieces to this by way of introduction. Uh, first off is that I am by no means a sociologist or a researcher or anything, an expert to, to, to kind of give, you know, information on any of this. I'm really just sharing anecdotal experience and my perspective. Um, and, uh, and I hope it has some, some worth to it and some, and some value, but I'm, I, I'm really, I can't speak um, from an academic perspective and I can't even speak from a quote unquote, you know, the Jewish experience. I'm, I'm just sharing my personal um, experience as a Jewish person and as a therapist serving the Jewish community. 
Um, so that's, that's piece number one. Piece number two, also kind of by introduction, is the Jewish community is uh, by no means monolithic at all. <laughs> so there is a wide variety of what mm. it means to be in the Jewish community, Jewish population. Uh, there's a wide spectrum of what that could mean. Um, there are non-affiliated or non-identifying uh, individuals who are, who are Jewish, but may not as identify as such, or uh, may identify as such, but are not necessarily engaged with Jewish tradition or um, you know, with, uh, with uh, you know, Jewish community or, or spirituality or religion. Um, there are people who are engaged um, and there is a whole variety of denominations. Uh, you know, there's, there's a, a denomination referred to as renewal, there's reconstructionist, there's reform, uh, there's conservative, there's uh, open orthodox, modern orthodox, uh, plain orthodox, centrist orthodox, there's uh, ultra orthodox, there is what's called yeshivish, there's what's called uh, Hasidic or pronounced Hasidic. Um, and within each of those, there's another, you know, huge variety of strands within, you know, there, there, there's just, there's a, a multitude of subgroups within the subgroups within the subgroups. And any group that I just left out was not by intention and, and, and I meant no, uh, no harm, just listing off the, uh, the group. So, you know, there's, there's a huge, and, 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 and what we talk about in this context uh, some of it will apply to all of those groups, but most of it will probably actually be very different for different groups. Um, and so what I'll just say is that what I'm going to be speaking about here in this context is my experience of specifically within the Orthodox community. Um, A, because that's more my experience, and B, because I think that's where, um, not exclusively so by any means, but I think that's where more of the cultural differences will come up. Um, in terms of how that population um, and that community um, meet and intersect with the therapy world. Um, I think outside of that group, there still are unique aspects to Jewish culture and Jewish experience and, and all that. But I think the, there will be less of a stark maybe difference from um, some of the, you know, from, from other, from a, from a broader population. Um, so speaking specifically about um, the Orthodox community um, in this context. Um, I guess those are just my, my points of, of introduction of where I, where I can speak from. I very much appreciate that. Um, and that's helped to, that there, there is so much uh, nuance. When you were listing off the different things, I was trying to do a comparable one of, you know, in Oklahoma here, it's, uh, you know, I, I was trying to do denominations here too. And uh, I, I think there's something extremely significant is that again, we're, we're saying we're all human, but one size doesn't fit all. And then even when we break down to, you know, smaller people groups that we're, we're talking about that there's still, it seems to me, there's still nuance to say, how do you frame that? How do you frame the question of like, you, you know what I mean? Break down to say, to be culturally sensitive and appropriate um, as a clinician, you know, in that context. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I don't know the answer. <laughs> and I think it speaks to actually a lot of what's happening uh, in the world at large today, which is how do you, um, how do you create sensitivity to minority groups? Um, and at the same time, um, you know, there, there's that, that, that brings up, I think, a lot of hot button, you know, a lot of contemporary challenges that were, you know, mm. um, that we're facing. You know, I'll just I'll, I'll give an example. I was actually recently at a, uh, at a, a training, uh, an EFT training, and um, th there were kind of two organizers of it, and one organizer opened up on the first day and asked everyone to, you know, on the Zoom by their name, put their preferred pronoun, and then the other organizer said, uh, well, actually, you know, the interesting time we live in, what we want to ask is that whoever wants to should please do that, and then for the people who don't want to, you don't need to, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, because some people would be, you know, maybe upset that they were asked that they were told they had to do that. And so it's like the sensitivity in one direction for some people will be an insensitivity in another direction. And then, and so, you know, that's just, it's yeah. a very, it's a very challenging, confusing time of trying to everyone trying to figure that out. I think. That's why I love this series because we want to ask questions and be that student be the cute that's something steve tells me all the time is be curious mm -hmm. stay curious Corey. stay <laughs> yes <Yeah>. sir <laughs> well, certainly 
Um, well, okay. So from your experience, um, if we talk about orthodox, um, what would be some of the, the, the nuances that you might think of for someone on the other side trying to serve and support um, an orthodox Jew in a therapeutic center? Are there things that we should maybe be, we therapists should be aware of in, in those conversations? And I don't even know where to lead you on that question other than to say what pops out to yeah. you immediately that we could help be a little bit more culturally sensitive. Yeah, I think there's a, uh, there's a number of things. Um, and this is certainly not going to be exhaustive, but the, the different things that come up for me. Um, one is that there is a, a unique intergenerational trauma that exists mm. for, I would say this, this part of it actually exists for, for Jewish people across the spectrum. Um, but, uh, but, but definitely within the Orthodox circle as well. Um, there's intergenerational trauma. I mean, the Holocaust wasn't that long ago, right? Mm. Uh, many, many people's, um, you know, grandparents were, you know, were, uh, were, were in the Holocaust, were in, uh, you know, Nazi concentration camps. Uh, many of them had their entire families killed. Um, you know, I can even speak for myself. I, I, I didn't even have grandparents, um, you know, in the Holocaust. Um, but I, you know, I, something I noticed about myself since I was a teenager. It's like anytime I go somewhere, I'm, I, I scan thinking about like, where would I be able to hide? Like, where would be the, where would there be like the, the, you know, the, the secret hiding place in the roof, you know, if I needed to, right. There's just this, this hereditary kind of trauma of that kind of a, that kind of a thing. Um, so, and, and that can exist on a number of different levels. Um, so a, a different form of that concept, I think is that for a lot of uh, Jewish people um, living now, let's say like my age, um, my age and younger, um, so our grandparents um, did things and were living in a time where they were doing things that were kind of um, almost like monumental. They were living in like a, a time period in history where people weren't just living like simple lives, right? Like I live a pretty simple life. <laughs> I live in a quiet neighborhood. Um, I have a, a job that I like doing that I go to every day, you know, in a, in a quiet office and, um, mm -hmm. and my wife has a job and, you know, and we have, a, we have, we have kids and we live a, you know, a pretty, pretty, you know, relatively speaking, I mean, it's pretty, it feels pretty action packed, but in terms of like historical significance, it's a pretty quiet and simple life as opposed to my grandparents, you know, my grandparents lived during like tumultuous times and like were, were pioneers involved in, you know, like historically changing events. Um, and so I look at them and it's like, well, there's nothing I can do that will like match that level of significance. And mm -hmm. I don't know that I want there to be anything, but at the same time, I feel kind of like a impossibility of being quote unquote as successful as them, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, you know, I'm speaking to that from like a personal sense, but, but I don't think that I'm alone in that experience. I think there's kind of, so that's a different form of like an intergenerational trauma of like, I can never be good enough. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not necessarily a trauma of fear of, of you know the the bad thing the anti-semitism and the bad things that have happened um but there's kind of a, a a hereditary sense of like i'll never live up to the giants you know that were just just you know 40 years ago um because i don't you know that's just not what my life is like um mm -hmm. and so can i still see myself as having you know worth in that kind of a way um so that that's just one i think interesting um peace for the Jewish community is, is a unique, and we're certainly not the only community that has very, very significant intergenerational trauma, but there's, I think, a, a unique form of it for the Jewish community. Um, that's one piece. Absolutely. I mean, just mentioning um, the Holocaust, mentioning Nazi Germany, that that was, not, it was before my time, your time, but our ancestors were, that was, if we weren't affected by it directly, it was in, it was all of the talk and yeah. conversation of the world. Yeah. And so that's such a, and you mentioned a term that I only want to smile because I want this message out, but intergenerational trauma related to that going, you having not directly connected, but because family and your faith and uh, connected that to look to escape routes, yeah. exit routes, you know, yeah. And that's one thing Steve's helped me understand, or at least try to attempt to, 
is 400 plus years of systemic oppression, slavery, and Mm -hmm. all all kinds of things that African-Americans in this country in particular have had to deal with and go. And then at all counselors, part of it is the trauma. I love that you're, you're a CSAT, you're talking about trauma at at the forefront and it's connection to, um, uh, coping mechanisms that are harmful to us and others. Uh, But just you highlighting that fact made me think about that in a different way. Uh, I'm glad we're talking about intergenerational trauma in general, but then connecting it to um, particular groups that are highly affected by it. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's, I I don't think there's anybody, I mean, I could be wrong, but I don't think there's any, any, any person who is any Jewish person who doesn't have, um, you know, within the past couple of generations, um, a connection to um, Jewish people, a direct family connection to genocide and massacre and life-threatening anti-Semitism. Um, you know, I, I don't have that directly to the Holocaust, but I have it to, you know, um, many other, you know, to family members being massacred in, in Hebron. And, and I have it too, you know, in my parents remembering, you know, that in 60, 1967, the, all the Jewish people living in, in, in Israel were, they, they literally thought they were all, they, the entire country was going to be, was going to be killed. Um, you know, mm. like it was going to be drowned in, you know, in the sea is, is, you know, there's nobody that doesn't, you know, the Holocaust is the biggest one, but there's nobody that doesn't have a direct family connection to anti-Semitic, um, you know, massacre and, and genocide. Um, across the board. Um, and so I think different people have different levels of consciousness of that, but it's certainly, um, it's certainly a piece for others. Well, so, okay, you have decided to focus uh, or a big part of your practice, or is it, ex- do you exclusively, I'm sorry, I missed that, but expl- exclusive, excuse me if I can talk, <laughs> exclusively right. talk to or support the Jewish people or um somehow you found that was a part of your mission and calling as a therapist how did that how did that all happen um yeah i I don't i'm not exclusively working with jewish population uh but i would say at this point predominantly i am um and Mm -hmm. it just kind of shifted naturally over time i didn't start that i would say i started out you know more in the general population and over time um within my local community i guess my name just kind of got around more um Mm -hmm. and started to and then and then that just snowballed into a to a, a large caseload of people within this community. Uh, you get good referrals when you're a great therapist doing good work for sure, especially in any community. Um, but do you, do you see uh, a lack of providers, therapists that are culture? Oh, how do I phrase this? Do you, do you see a lack of therapists, available therapists to support and serve um, the Jewish people, like for instance, we had uh, the Just This Week Indigenous Peoples uh, discussion around this. And w- one is, you know, I live in Oklahoma, like I said, so you got the five civilized tribes, you got uh, heavy Indigenous people here. In fact, I did some consulting for one of the, um, uh, the Chickasaw Nation. And so, um, you know, how do you, how do you even approach yeah. Uh, not understanding, you know, do you see a lack of um, people like yourselves serving your community? It's a good question. Um, I would say that, um, so there's, there's kind of two, two parts or components, I guess, to that. One is, are there therapists who themselves are Jewish or Orthodox that are serving the Orthodox community? Um, as therapists. And I think, um, at least in Chicago, in the Chicago area, um, there, there is not, an, there are not enough. Um, I would say there's, there is for sure not enough male Orthodox therapists, which is in my benefit, I get a lot of good business. Um, but, but it's also uh, to my detriment, because I would, I could use some good uh, collaboration and colleagues and, and referral sources. Um, so, mm-hmm. um, uh, the, you know, that, that's one, one version of it, but the other is, are there, are there therapists who don't have to be Jewish, um, who are, uh, kind of culturally competent and able to, to do that work. And, you know, that we, you know, to, to refer to, um, and I think that's, I think it's a tricky question. You know, I think, uh, this will kind of go back to the first question you asked also 
um, about what are the nuanced needs of the of the Orthodox community. And I guess there's two points I want to bring up here that I think are really core um, and I think speak to both questions. So the first is that I think one of the trickiest things of working with um, I guess I'll say three things. <laughs> one, one of the trickiest things of working with uh, the Orthodox community is to be able to sift through um, the maladaptive behaviors that are dressed up in faith and piety. Mm. So, so to be able to see that, you know, this is not you being very spiritual and this is not in the name of your religious belief and system. And this is not from your rabbi. Um, this is um, OCD or this is anxiety mm. or this is, um, you know, this is um, OCPD um, or this is, um, you know, some some trauma, um, you know, maladaptive behavior from a trauma. Um, and to be able to sift through that is really complex, even for somebody who, who knows the culture and knows the laws and the rituals and the faith, um, you know, or, you know, some people having like a religious belief of like a very kind of linear way of thinking about reward and punishment um, mm. and realizing that that's not, that's not your, you can quote me a source from the Talmud or something, but that, but if you, you know, but that's not what's really going on here, right? This is mm -hmm. you looking for control over a situation you have no control over and you've created control by creating this intellectualized um, understanding of how, you know, everything that happens to you is because you did something, et cetera. Um, so to, 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 to sift through that, it's very complex. Um, I, I, that, that's one of the biggest challenges, even I would say for me. And so certainly for anybody who has less in, inside familiarity um, with what those rituals and sources and texts and beliefs are. Um, and that's where I would say that I think that anybody who really wants to uh, be able to serve the, the, the Orthodox community well, um, I think one of the most important things would be to have um, somebody who is versed in that knowledge and also has a healthy mental health perspective that you collaborate and consult with. Um, mm -hmm. So almost to have like a relationship with a rabbi or, okay. you know, um, or, or maybe, you know, a therapist who is versed in this stuff. But I think that that would be almost, maybe I would say that like one of the most important things to be able to have both the skills and also the trust of the people coming to you and the community and the referral sources um, would be to have a relationship with somebody who can help you sift through that. Because on the one hand, we want to be culturally respectful of people's beliefs, but we also don't want those things to kind of you know, we don't want our, our cultural sensitivity to be mm -hmm. um, almost manipulated into endorsing behaviors that are actually mental health related issues. Um, you know, I just, I, to give like a parallel example of that, I just experienced this with somebody. Um, so I'm, I, I mean, no offense by this to anybody who is a, a very, you know, devout um, dog lover and, and person. I, I just happen not to be. I, I just don't connect to that. It's, I, I don't have any, not, I just, I, it's just not who I am. Um, so, but I had a client whose childhood dog was just put down and he was, he was grieving, really, really grieving. And, um, and it was, it was hard for me because he also happens to have a histrionic nature of things being very dramatic all the time and very, um, you know, kind of his, his emotions will skyrocket from, from very, very small things. And mm -hmm. I, because I have no experience with grieving and having a relationship with, with a dog, I had a very hard time knowing, well, is this really healthy grief? What are the limits to healthy grief? Are there limits? Maybe there's no limit. I don't know. I want to be sensitive to that, but I also want to make sure this isn't his maladaptive kind of histrionic mm -hmm. side and how do I, so, and I was thinking like, well, you know, I have no, I don't know how to sift through that. And I actually reached out to people to get some input on that. Um, but I think that's a kind of parallel to this. Like, if you don't know the, the dynamics of the religion, how do you know how to sift through which parts are authentically healthy faith and which parts are rooted in some, some sort of other issue? So good. I, I didn't even think of that, but being able to call a rap rabbi or any, I mean, that, that can apply in so many contexts, but I love the fact that you said the dog. And I know there are non-dog 
lover people out there. <laughs> I thought I saw a meme or something on that at one point, but that, thank you for that example. Um, that That is excellent. I think you had a couple more thoughts on that, but I'd love to hear, I'd love to hear those if you have more. Yeah. Um, the other thing I would say is um, that, so this is a, this is a tricky and sensitive piece, but I think it's an important one. Um, the, the therapy world um, tends to be obviously not, not um, general over generalizing to everybody, but tends to be uh, more politically progressive uh, in nature. Um, I think uh, to, to a large degree, at least that's my experience. Um, the, the Orthodox Jewish world also not by over generalizing or is this the case for everybody, but tends to be more, more politically conservative in nature. And I think that they're actually, and, and I've actually experienced this firsthand um, at, um, at conferences or, or trainings with other therapists, um, I would say not as much anti-Semitism, but anti-Orthodox. Um, and I think there's, there's, there's a lot of discomfort or fear or mistrust for people within the Orthodox community to reach out to therapists um, to kind of look up any therapist that they find on psychology today or on, you know, whatever it is, mm -hmm. um, because of the climate we live in with political, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the political climate we live in and, and identity politics and the amount of shaming of other that goes on in, in both directions. Um, and I actually think that as, you know, I spoke before about anti-Semitism um, in, a, in a kind of intergenerational trauma, um, and there still is, you know, some of that kind of <clears throat> anti-Semitism that exists from the, you know, far right, um, you know, th that exists that, that the Jewish community experiences. But I think when it comes to the therapy context, if we're talking about um, creating um, connections between the therapy world and the Jewish Orthodox world, I actually think the more relevant version of anti-Semitism is the is the feeling of the, of the political divide or the anti-Orthodox divide um, of some of those conservative values um, and, and what that does for the, for the community to be more hesitant um, reaching out to, well, I don't know if I will be able to say what I think. I don't know if I can speak my, my values or to actually have a trusting and safe relationship with this person because you know, what if I, um, you know, what if I'm judged for, you know, be, you know, what if I'm judged for, for the views or the values that I hold or the way that I identify politically? Um, so, I mean, there's a, you know, there's obviously a lot of nuances in there and that's a big, like I said, it's a sensitive topic to unpack, but I think it's, I think it's a really, a really big piece um, of the relationship between the Orthodox community and the, and the therapy community. So I want to go back and play it against, um, not playing, but I am the student here. When you say anti-Semitism and then anti-Orthodox, mm -hmm. what, what what does that mean? Um, yeah, so you know, I, I would say because a lot of the, um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the anti-Orthodox even comes in from within the Jewish community itself, from right. those outside the Orthodox community, um, and a lot of it really, and that's why I'm connecting the political piece and the Orthodox piece because a lot of it is really related to politically related issues. Okay. Um, yeah. Would I be accurate in characterizing from your experience, potentially anti-Semitism, external Jewish from non-Jewish communities in, mm -hmm. and then maybe the anti-Orthodox is within Jewish more, more so more so. Yeah. I think that's, that's, okay. that's well said actually. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, not, okay. that's not exclusively so, but yes, I think that that's well said in a general sense. Yeah. Understand. Yeah. Okay. So there is part of our work here in, my, my personal why I put my own time and money into this endeavor is um, to obliterate the stigma of mental health in general. Mm. And I just see it. And, and if I, if from my experience, I see a lot of, and I'm going to generalize again here, but a lot of men struggle with therapy. I've been in groups of high, high charging entrepreneurs and I'll say, well, you know, I met with my counselor this week and kind of get the, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And, yeah. I'm wondering, I mean, I think we can all admit there's still a stigma in, in, in any culture on the face of the earth around mm -hmm. mental health. As it relates to your experience 
with Jewish people, how does how, it, what are some of the nuances you've observed and seen related to the stigma about getting mental health treatment or seeing a therapist or a counselor, regardless of who, who, who else is on the other side of the. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, um, I think within the Orthodox community, the big shift is, is the rabbis getting more on board with therapy and mental health awareness. I think that we are seeing, um, again, I don't, I don't know this. I'm not a researcher, so I, I don't know the statistics, but at least this is my impression um, is that we've seen a big shift in um, there's still ways to go, as you said, but there's a big shift in, um, in the stigma and, and shifting in the sense of the stigma declining um, within the Orthodox community, the Jewish community and people um, reaching out for a lot more therapy. Um, you mm -hmm. know, uh, all the therapists who are who are Jewish and Orthodox and in the community that I that I work, um, we're all we're all full. We're all busy, and we're all predominantly seeing Orthodox individuals. Um, so there are a lot of people who are seeking therapy. Um, a lot of Orthodox people are seeking therapy. Um, there's probably a lot more that need to be, and are you know some of them not doing so because of stigma. But I think there's a there's a big shift in that direction, and I think the biggest piece is that. Uh, a lot more um, rabbis have kind of come on board um, with the importance of that. And I think that they um, oftentimes are now referring people to therapists. So a lot of my referrals come from having, having built relationships with um, rabbis in the community and constituents or, you know, go to them, you know, bringing up an issue and they'll say, you know, maybe yeah. there's something to speak to a therapist about and, you know, here's someone to reach out to. Well, so back to your huge takeaway, which is contact a, a, a rabbi in your area and start asking questions yeah. is the potential to go. This is a culturally sensitive therapist that is sought to to yeah. understand our faith exactly. and our, you know, and so that that's a I, I'm going to say it from a complete business sense. Mm -hmm. One, it's right thing to do, but second is there's an opportunity there to serve more people that are under potentially underserved. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, my experience comes from evangelical churches and I, I I've got 30 hours of seminary training and the, the hiccup for, in my experience was, well, it, th this dynamic between psychology and what is thought of as biblical truth mm. and this thing of like, well, is it a Christian counselor? And, and then I think that that's created a very unnecessary wall yeah. between the two. So yeah. I kind of try to liken a little bit of what you're saying to, I, I think I get it on another, in a different, yeah, there's a lot of overlap there. I think, I think, yeah. to, you know, to my knowledge of, of that side of things too, which is limited, but I, but I, I, I think there's a lot of overlap there. Yeah. But, but what I've loved about your message is there's an opportunity to partner, so to speak, or collaborate, or mm -hmm. just tear some of the walls down by seeking out that faith representative, that faith leader yeah. in whatever community and saying, how can I better, i uh, that's really good. Um, okay, so we talked about stigma a little bit, that that's a human feature right now that we're trying to all obliterate, yeah. regardless of um, faith, race. Um, the Do you see other, and you kind of broached on politics, which, oh my gosh, there could be a whole series on this about how to help people through politics, or or the, the political climate we found ourselves in the last yeah. uh, years. Um, what are the things that I've missed to ask that you <laughs> think of? <laughs> and we probably need more time, don't we? Uh, um, no, I think you, I think you asked all the right questions. I guess if we have, I don't know how, you know, do we have, if we have a little more time, I would maybe add a couple of other answers to the question of, um, you know, what are the nuances to know about? Um, yes, please. Yes. But I, th I think that that kind of is the, qu I think you asked the right questions. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. If you have any more nuances, I'd love those. I want to make sure we get those um, mm -hmm. too. And if those of you are listening have questions, please hit the chat or Q&A and we'll ask those uh, today. So I want to make sure we have room too, but we have about 20 minutes. And so okay. I'd love to hear any of the other nuances. I don't want to, I just, yeah, I want to yeah. shut up and listen. <laughs> no, 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 it's great. It's great. Um, so one other thing I would say is, uh, you know, I kind of talked about intergenerational trauma, but then if we just stay more locally focused, uh, forget intergenerational trauma, uh, just straight on trauma. Um, mm -hmm. there's, 
the same traumas that exist um, across the board uh, for going back to that, we're, we're all humans. Um, and yeah. so those, those types of things uh, exist across the board, but I think there are also unique traumas um, to growing up that are, that are possibly there for growing up in the, in the Orthodox community um, that might be you know, important to know about and understand. Um, and I think there are, there are different, different traumas for men and for women. Um, mm. for, for men, there's, I think, oftentimes uh, within the more, um, as you get more into the ultra of the ultra Orthodox community, um, you know, so middle to, 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 to ultra, um, you, you will find that the system really kind of narrows in on Talmud study for men. Um, and Talmud study, which is this highly, highly intricate text of Jewish law story. Um, it's, it's an amazing, you know, text and, and it's, it's fascinating, but it's also incredibly difficult and, and, and intricate. Um, and it's, it's, and, and in many ways it becomes the, it, it has become the be all and end all, um, of, of a, of a man's, of an Orthodox male life. Um, yeah. and, and there are lots of people who are just not cut out for that, but they're in the system that makes it all about that. Um, and that's a unique trauma that I think a lot of people, um, a lot of people, uh, experience, um, and then continue to experience trauma reenactment around, because when you try and work with them on, um, creating other spiritual pathways for meaning, because they don't want to give up religion, they don't want to give up spirituality. There's a resistance, um, to actually exploring other ways of living a Jewish spiritual and religious life. Um, because they're still seeking that, that success. And that's kind of that, that, that trauma reenactment. Um, so there are other, other examples, but that's just one, um, again, because I'm working so, so primarily with, um, Orthodox males, um, that's one that I see a lot of. Um, and I think it's, a, I think it's an important, important piece. Yeah. Related specifically toward, uh, uh, those who identify as male, in, in the Orthodox and ultra or Orthodox um, Jewish faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then I think for women, there's kind of a potential, potential parallel around modesty and dress um, within the Orthodox and ultra Orthodox community. Um, I, I can't speak to that as much. I don't have as much experience working with that. Um, it doesn't seem to me to be as pervasive as the the, the, the trauma from the Talmud study. Um, but I don't even, that might not be true. It might be as pervasive or if not more. Um, mm -hmm. but I think that's the other kind of unique, um, unique aspect, um, to, to possible traumas. And then of course, there's all the other good traumas out there. Um, but those are just two, you know, two unique versions. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, the other piece that I would point out as being, I think a, a nuance is, um, spiritual bypassing. Um, which is not unique to Judaism, um, but there's a form of it that will definitely exist within Judaism. So people will, who will kind of believe, you know, have a, a faith um, of, you know, everything, everything that happens is for the best. It's all from God. It's what's meant to be. Um, and, um, and, or just engaging in spiritual practice. Um, and they can sometimes be doing that as a way of spiritual bypassing. So they're not bringing their spirituality into their healing. That is extremely powerful and healthy. And I love that. And I love mm -hmm. when clients are open to doing that. That's to me, I, I never force that on anyone, but when they're open to that, that's one of the most powerful experiences I find. Um, and so bringing spirituality into the therapeutic process and into the realness of life and of struggle, that's beautiful. Uh, but sometimes people take that spirituality, not as, not as bringing it into the healing, but as a way of not needing to heal. Um, because I'm just able to divert, I'm able to bypass all my problems by, well, I have faith and it's all from God and it's all meant to be. Um, and I don't need to really, you know, look at, I'm so engrossed in Talmud study or prayer or charity or community work or whatever it is that mm -hmm. I don't need to look at the fact that my marriage is failing or the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with this, this, and this, um, because, you know, I'm doing all these, you know, spiritual practices, or I have this level of faith. Um, and I think, again, that kind of goes back to, we need to, to know the nuances of when is it bypassing and when is it part of, 
you know, a healthy, a healthy spirituality. I was going to ask what that is, but I think you unpacked that just now uh, about spiritual birth and uh, definitely relevant in other faith systems that I'm aware of for sure. And that's yeah. uh, a good point. Like you were saying, trying to unpack a little bit of the pull out. I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing rephrasing in my own words, but to, you know, pull out and separate the issues a little bit and go, okay, here, here it is. But this one is, okay, are we overlooking critical things? For instance, mm-hmm. you said to your marriage. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, one thing we didn't talk about, or I didn't expand on that you mentioned, um, we talked about, you know, we come back and forth to inter- intergenerational trauma. Um, but the, I put down here, you know, the good enough, am I as successful? I think that might be my word, word, but as successful as previous generation was. And it feels, I'm just trying to, for my own, it's going, there's something there that might be a little tick above what I've seen in other people, but talk to me more about that. The, the success, like, yeah, we've heard of this, the greatest generation and I hear that too, but I get it. Like the people have been through horrific things, survived Mm -hmm. resilient and done amazing things with their life, despite all the horrific tragedy in their lives. Yeah. Can you talk to me a little bit more about that and unpack that from your own Experience. Yeah, and I would say in addition to the intergenerational piece, again, just sticking with more of the here and now, um, there's the the Orthodox community just has such high standards and expectations. Um, you know, pretty much any all the all the kids are going through a dual curriculum. You know, so they're expected. You know, they're they're taking um, you know Judaic and and general studies. Um, so they're in school for a long, you know, really long day, and getting home with you know dual dual curriculum in school, which means double the homework. Um, and, um, you know, so on, already for kids, there's just such, there's, there's a lot of, you know, high expectations. And then, um, you know, whether it's in Talmud study or it's career um, or it's financial, I mean, you know, to live a Orthodox lifestyle is very expensive. Um, you know, you, you, you typically are living in a, in a specific community because it's walking distance to a synagogue. Um, and so the, the housing, you know, rates in those communities, they, they jump up way high. Um, kosher food costs a lot of money. Everyone is sending to uh, private school, um, which costs a lot of money. And people have a lot of kids. Um, the expectation is to have a lot of children. Um, and so, um, you know, you need to have a career where you're going to be making a lot of money. Um, and you need to do that while also raising a large family, while also, um, you know, uh, uh, Orthodox men are expected to pray in synagogue with, you know, with a group, you know, three times a day, um, as well as, you know, continue their Talmud study and, and, and keep, you know, all these holidays and rituals and practice and all this different stuff. Um, and then, and, and I'm by no means putting more, the, the women are pressurized tremendously in terms of expectations also. So there's, there's just super high expectation. And I don't mean to make it all sound bad. It's that a lot of it's beautiful and, and, and amazing. Um, but there's just, if we boil it down, there's just really high expectations, really mm-hmm. high pressure um, and pressure to be something, pressure to, to do something in one way or another, whether it's because you're going to be the philanthropist or the charitable one, um, you know, to the, to the private school or to the synagogue or to the, to the, um, you know, communal organization and the nonprofit, whatever it is, or because you're going to be the great Torah scholar, or because you're going to, you know, have the family that everyone goes to for when they need help with something, or, you know, there's just, there's, there's a lot, a lot of expectation, a, a tremendous amount. Um, life is incredibly busy and exhausting for your average, um, you know, average Orthodox lifestyle in a way that's when lived in a healthy way is, it's an exhausting that's meaningful, right? So it's an exhausting that is yeah. passionate and inspired and it's, and it's, and, and the exhaustion is actually like, yeah, I'm exhausted because I just, I just lived an amazingly significant day. Um, but also can I just be, and can I not be pressured and do I not have to do something amazing? Can I just, can I just accept myself? Um, and can I believe that, that yes, God, God, love is proud of me doing all these things, but he also just loves me for me. And I'm, I'm created in God's image and, and period, that's it. And I'm, I'm unconditionally loved and endlessly loved. And no matter what I've done, no matter what I don't fit into in the system. And um, so these are, are, I think some of the, the, the really significant pieces that come up when we talk about standards is that, that 
that unconditional self-acceptance and self-love and how does that fit into the amount of pressure and expectation and standards that the community um, and that the the faith kind of places within the within a person's orbit so i was just on session with my counselor yesterday and first thing she asks she always comes back to is self-care yeah and it's the one i'm like really you have to ask me because no i'm not eating right i'm not drinking drinking water all day i'm not actually you know those kind of things but in your experience too how, how does that with all of these things that someone could be juggling like just thinking about that i've got kids too eight and six and they're not juggling simultaneous curriculum and things yeah. but like um so where how about self-care yeah from, from i, I your... would say in my in my in my opinion um i think this is like maybe the biggest kind of pervasive issue is how do we balance um the fact that that there's there's a, a real value and belief to these kind of expectations and standards of living in a very meaningful and inspired way and productive way but at the same time really living with self-acceptance and self-worth um mm -hmm. and um and how do we balance or live with the fact that God is, you know, within the Jewish faith, God is giving me all these, um, you know, rituals um, to to do, but he also loves me even if I don't do them. And he just loves me. Um, and how do we have that unconditional acceptance and unconditional love balanced with, um, you know, and, and they really are not contradictory, but people can think that they are. Um, and I, I would say one of the most common um, pieces that I'm, working through with people is that self-care and self-acceptance are when I bring those things up, like you just did, um, they're rejected and they're rejected in the name of religion. So, mm -hmm. you know, my, uh, you know, Judaism doesn't believe that Judaism wants me to, to work on myself and to grow and to, to, to become a better person and all that. And, um, and to do all these things. Um, and, you know, people will even quote like, sources or rabbis and that you know but but really judaism also believes that that god loves you endlessly and unconditionally um and that you have inherent worth um and that self-care is important um and sources can always be taken out of context and manipulated and and twisted into whatever we want to twist them into right you know rabbinic yes. texts from thousands of years ago <laughs> can be twisted yes. into anything right so um you know, yes. that I think you, what you brought up, you really hit on one of the core, I think as a society, that's not unique to the Jewish community. It's just the way that it gets dressed up is yes. unique to the Jewish community. But that is, you know, that's core to across the globe. That's, you know, that's going on everywhere. Um, that, that struggling to figure that, that paradox or that dialectic uh, out is, is core to the human experience. I can totally see that. So with the last couple of minutes we have, uh, well, first, I want to say anything else that we haven't talked that you're like, I want to get this thing out um, so I don't waste any time and let you have that. Thank you. No, I think that um, the, the kind of points that I had come in hoping to be able to, to articulate, uh, hopefully I've done. And I think we hit on some of the, the big ones. Yeah, absolutely. Well, with the last couple of minutes, I want to just talk about trust. As a, I mean, that is absolutely critical in the therapeutic, you know, container, I think is how mm -hmm. most therapists, but so how, if I'm, if I'm a therapist and I'm seeing an Orthodox Jew, for instance, or you know, in my office, um, is there anything that you might suggest to help with, you know, trust in that situation? Mm -hmm. um, I think we've covered some sensitivity, but I want to just kind of broadly asked the question is I know that's critical to the therapy. Yeah. Relationship. I mean, I, I really, again, I, I'm curious to know if other people sh would share this perspective, um, you know, and, and people can fully, you know, feel that this shouldn't be the case, you know, I mean, you know, but in my perspective, I think that what is the case, whether it should or shouldn't be, I think the biggest barrier to trust is what's going on politically. Um, and, and the, and the divide again, like I said before, that the therapy world tends to be more politically progressive and the Orthodox world tends to be more politically conservative and the amount of shaming that goes on in both directions, I just think is the biggest barrier to trust. Um, 
I, I think it's, I think it's huge. I don't know how to address that. I don't know what the answer is. Um, but oh, I mean, I think the answer is more tolerance, uh, you know, on both yeah. sides, but, uh, but you know, that's easy to say. Um, but I, I think that really, I mean, there are some like, you know, specifics, you know, could talk about, um, you know, Orthodox, um, men and women are not gonna, um, would, would typically won't be, um, uh, shaking hands with someone from the opposite gender, um, or, or pieces like that. Um, there's some, you know, there's some specific details, but I, I really think the biggest barrier is the political climate. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I think, you know, even just what's going on right now in the, you know, in, in the Middle East is, uh, you know, there's, there's a yes. lot, you know, um, there's, there's a lot that is getting in the way of trust for, I think, the Orthodox community with what, what is perceived to be um, a kind of anti-Israel, anti-Orthodox um, kind of um, you know message that that is that's being heard, and and sometimes some of that is 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 the community kind of playing victim itself, um, and some of that is sometimes it's it is very real, it is very um, you know one-sided or or um, or shaming, um, but but whatever it is, that I think is the biggest barrier to trust by far and away in terms of if we're talking about the relationship between the Orthodox community and the therapy community. Mm, that's a great, 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 great nuance right there. I think um, speaking as a non-clinician um, to, to, you know, it, it would seem to me you'd want to lower every barrier. And one of those is, is being open and understanding the people that you're supporting are not going to share political beliefs. I mean, I don't know any of us that match up hundred percent, right. even the, my my lovely wife of 10 years um but uh i'll try to keep those to a minimum anyway you know um it is a unique climate and i know i was just talking with a colleague um in my former uh i had a software company before this and um she and her company are based in israel and she goes i don't know if you've heard the news and i was like i feel like i've got my head in the ground and i haven't um and now but I, i understand there's a lot going on and will continue to be in in the country here and there. Yeah. Sir, thank you for your time. Thank you. It's been excellent. It's been oh, really nice. Would you mind sharing how we, how others can learn about you and your work and your, and your uh, practice sure. and, and elsewhere yeah. and social media, if you're, you're on and all that, we'd love to uh, share that with our audience here. Yeah. Thank you for the, for giving me the opportunity to do that. Uh, my website is mindbodychicago.com. Um, so my practice is called Mind Body Therapy. The website is mindbodychicago.com. Um, if anyone wants to, I uh, would love to, to talk more. And you can definitely email me, um, Yaakov, Y-A-K-O-V, at mindbodychicago.com. Um, and uh, I'm not so much on, on social media, but I do have, I'll, I'll throw out there that I do have um, a small uh, YouTube channel called Life Torah. So the word life and then the word Torah, T-O-R-A-H, uh, which is the Hebrew word for Bible. Um, and, uh, I will say that it is, it is specifically, um, it's content that is, um, Jewish content with, um, psychotherapeutic ideas weaved into it. Um, and it's, and it's, it's made, um, for a Jewish audience and for an Orthodox audience. So I don't translate all the terms that I use in Hebrew. And I, I take for granted knowledge of some of the concepts and references. So I will put that out there. It's not made to be accessible to everybody. Um, it's made specifically for a a particular, um, niche audience. Um, but if anyone's curious, just by way of like, kind of getting a flavor of some of like the, the kind of, I don't know, orthodoxy and psychotherapy stuff, you might be, they're just short videos. You could check it out for whatever that's worth. I, I'm trying to find the link real quick to put in the chat here. I put mindbodychicago.com in the chat and we'll have these in the show notes as well. But, um, what, what is the channel name? The channel name is, is uh, Life Torah, one word, L-I-F-E-T-O-R-A-H. That's what I was doing wrong. Okay, I've got it. It might not even have enough views to, to pop up. <laughs> no, that's great. Uh, no, Excellent, excellent. I'm going to put this in the chat too, and we'll have it in the show notes um, for later. Yakov, thank you so much for your time today and being so willing to share your experiences, both as therapist and someone in this community. We're trying to help others sell and, and ourselves to serve and support better. Thank you. I love this initiative. 
really, uh, really glad you guys are doing it. Thank you for letting me be a part of it. Good to be a student. I get to do all this. Well, thank you, Sarah. You have a great week and thank you everybody for joining us again. Go check out Yakov's worth at, at uh, mindbodychicago.com and we'll have links too to his YouTube channel. Thank, thank you, sir. Have a great day. Thanks, Corey. You too.